Interesting. One of the boys is up at number four. Or number five. He's not so certain of me. There's nothing quite like, a pro they're not as confident as the adults. They're going to walk a little bit more around me. <laughs> I don't think the Telemates are that used to seeing the roofs. That's something I noticed, I did a habituation program with leopards years ago. And the leopards definitely didn't like the roofs because they were seen more often without roofs than with roofs. So when there were roofs, their behavior was slightly different. Obviously here, our Uncle Homer Pride has seen us in thick and thin, so we've had roofs, we haven't had roofs, but the Telemates saw Tristan the other day, but they were so preoccupied with, with their meal. Look at this one, it's like, what on earth are you? Yes, that's my leg. Don't you look at my leg like that. <laughs> Never gets old, everybody. Uh-uh. No. That's Theo at the back there. Theo's getting a little bit concerned. Don't worry, Theo. You'll be all right. The lion's looking right up in the back going, hmm, what's going on in the back here? <laughs> here come the rest of them. Now they're walking straight up the road behind us. So uh, they're lying down again. One's just had a, a pee. I don't know how it is that they can be hungry, but it seems as if they are. Maybe they're just a little bit bored of being in the same place for two solid days, and they decided, we're going to move. These ones can still see the rest. They haven't gone very far. They just moved slightly. So when we track lions, you'll often find where they move, and then they lie down like this, and they're very characteristic sort of tracks in the sand of the lion's body how they've been lying down, and it's something they do regularly when they're walking. They'll lose sense of something, the wind will drop, drop down, they'll get tired, and they'll just all stop. And then all of a sudden, they'll start moving again, and then follow the leader continues. And although we talk about predators like lions and leopards being very nocturnal, um, they haven't needed to move because they've been so full. Sorry, like it comes there. They haven't needed to move because they've been so full and now that it's overcast, nothing to stop them moving in these conditions. Bless you. Okay, everybody, well, we're not going to go anywhere. We might move back a bit and follow the pride, but in the meantime, oh, we're just going to spend a few moments watching them walk past one by one. I'm sure Steve is going to spend his morning with the pride. doesn't seem like there's really many other places to be. But we're watching a crested Franklin who's just displayed the most weird behavior. There's an elephant that's just come out in front of us. Um, maybe we should show the Ellie rather than a crested Franklin. It's a nice big bull that's crossing the road. No, don't cross so fast, Ellie. <sighs> He's gone already. You just see his bum disappearing into the mist. Um, so that doesn't help very much. You can see what we're dealing with animal-wise. It's Unless they're walking on the road, you've got very little chance to watch them. Um, but this little crested Franklin just ate a slug. Now, I've never, ever, 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 ever seen Crested Franklin's eating slugs. I have no idea why it ate the slug, but it did. It looks quite chuffed with itself. Um, maybe just a bit of protein to try and get the energy levels up and to try and stay as warm as possible. But weird, that's for sure. I'll sit, I'll sit here and let you guys listen because the sounds this morning are actually pretty cool. There's lots and lots of birds that are all singing today.
Right, we're going to leave the slug killer. We'll try and see if we can catch up with those ellies and get a view of them at some point down the road. Anybody out there? Okay, well, you're back with us, everybody. The lions are on the move. They're heading south now on quarantine. Some of them have just stopped to have a little bit of a drink in one of the puddles. If we can get them doing so. Here we go. Eight of them in front of us. Heard a baboon off to my right hand side going, wow. Basically, there's the lions, everybody. So we might see them hunting now, everybody. It's not un impossible. Um, maybe they were just thirsty, but it's possible that one of the females is feeling a little bit peckish, a bit snacking, a bit snacky, sorry. Let me move up a bit so that we can get closer to these lines before the rest of the pride catches up. They're all slowly coming from the right there. They're cutting the corner. Not too bad, not too concerned with walking through the wet grass as the rain starts to fall once more. It'd be lovely to be on the other side of that puddle watching them um, drinking. See, they don't like the water. See how they go around it? Although they do like to drink, the lions don't like to get wet. I do get a lot of their moisture from the animals and the blood that they feed on, but they will drink whenever it's available. And that looks delicious, doesn't it? Nice sedimented runoff water. Baboons are not happy behind. Oh, they're on the floor. We can't see them clearly, but they're walking through the long grass there. And you never know, we might see activity. Nicole, what keeps me safe from the lions? Well, Nicole, they, as, as strange as it might sound, the lions don't really identify us individually on the vehicle as, as humans or as food. Um, from an early age, uh, well, anyway, a prada lion that gets found or any big cat that gets found uh, is often quite skittish and afraid of this vehicle. And they're also very skittish and afraid of people in general. But people in general is something that these animals have been instinctively sort of wary of for, since time memorial. Memorial, a very, very long time. But a vehicle is quite a new invention. So they've never learned to fear it. If uh, the first time lions encountered a vehicle and they got shot from it or hit with it or food stolen, they would start to dislike the vehicle and maybe be quite skittish or even aggressive towards it. But uh, habituation is the process whereby you can view these animals safely, eventually quite close up because they get so used to the vehicle that they don't see it as a threat, they just see it as this thing that seems to follow them around. It's a, it's a very interesting sort of process, but uh, if you encounter a wild pride of lions that's never seen a car before, their behavior is gonna be very different. They're gonna be very skittish, they're gonna lie flat, they might growl, they might even become quite aggressive towards a car. But um, if you habituate the adults, the youngsters learn very quickly that mm, mum's not concerned, so I'm not going to be concerned. Oh, we're having a walk by. So 
So what keeps us safe is the fact that um, they don't really identify us as food. And you can see that, by the way, that they don't look at us like that. There's definitely an interest in what's going on. And when the wheels start turning, the youngsters are often quite interested in what it is that the wheels are. But uh, every now and again, you have to discipline them in a way and just say, no, nope, don't do that. The adults don't seem to, to pay the same attention to the wheels or the movement of the car as the youngsters do. And they quickly uh, lose that sort of interest. But you've got to be aware. I mean, uh, many of the cam ops that we have sitting on the back of these vehicles, they, they feel the lions stare and they feel quite intimidated. So it's definitely important to be aware of it. But uh, I've had lions walking past the car many, many times. And it always feels quite um, exhilarating. But um, <laughs> they generally leave the vehicles alone. Generally leave the girls at the vehicles alone. Very thirsty. Lions has been a hard evening just sitting down there doing absolutely nothing, hasn't it? Digestion takes its toll on the animal's body. Baboons have definitely spotted the lions. They're not making the same noise as they make when they see a leopard. Because they know they can get away from a lep lions. Lisa, they are. It's a very pretty pride. There's a boy right there. You can see he's got a bit of a fur on his chest. Uh, I think there's only two sub-adult boys here from what I've seen. I haven't spent an enormous amount of time with the Talamartis, but the last few times I've been with them, it's definitely two sub-adult males, and the rest seem to be girls. Look at that power, though, in the chest. Can you see it? The one to the right is a chest, a huge power in the chest. They are very, very powerful animals. I mean, it's not comparable to, to take a human and make a human the same weight as a lion and think we would be the same uh, strength. It's just not. You know, a lioness, like that one on the right there, is weighing in the region of 280 pounds, 300 pounds maybe at the most. Now, you take a human and put him in that sort of weight category and um, he would not never be as, as mobile, as flexible, as agile, or as physical. It's going to be strong. Don't, don't, let me, don't get me wrong. But the, the strength, the wiriness, and the sort of tautness of the muscles and the ability for these animals to move, charging speed of 90 kilometers an hour. That's 45, 46 mile an hour charging speed. Now you take a 135 kilogram human being and make him run at 45 miles an hour. It's not possible. 280 pound human being run at 45 miles an hour. 46, 7 miles an hour. <laughs> the four legs do help everybody. I'm not going to lie. The four legs do make a huge difference. So you see that lioness we were looking at before. If we go back to her, you'll see how she's just interested. She's looking at the baboons from a distance going, I'd really like to eat one of those, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. So you've got to be cognizant of those sort of looks that these animals give. And many times in the past on a vehicle, I've had a lion suddenly start looking at my vehicle like that or going a little bit flat, and you realize that someone on the back has stood up um, the animal's behavior changes very quickly, and it's very important when you are on a vehicle uh, with lions, with leopards, regardless of how relaxed you might think they are, to maintain your body within the vehicle and not to stand up, not to climb off, of course, while they're visible, because their behavior can change to one of, 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 of a different nature. Essentially, we talk about comfort zones around animals, zones that will affect them, zones that will change their behavior. Gabby, I haven't noticed the individual with the injured leg, but they all seem to be walking quite well this morning. 
doesn't seem to be too any limps or anything. I think she had an injury on the inside of one of the legs, did she? I can't remember. But I haven't noticed anything. Um, these animals are very, very powerful. They're very good at healing. And a little injury on the leg isn't, isn't too much to concern them. So we talk about comfort zones. We talk about zones around an animal. There's the complete comfort zone when animals are... And these change every day. Don't ever think that an animal's got a, a zones around them that are always going to be the same regardless of what happens. But those zones, one is the complete comfort zone. And then you get a bit closer and you get the alert zone where the animal's aware of you, but it doesn't really change its behavior. You just can tell that it's aware. And then you get the warning zone, a zone that the animal will start to show you signs of displeasure. And then you get the critical zone. Now, in the critical zone, you are actually asking for an enormous amount of trouble. And if you ever get into the critical zone with an animal, you've done something very wrong. Done something very wrong. And uh, the problem with, with a vehicle is a vehicle isn't deemed by the animals as the same sort of potential danger as they would feel if it was a human being. And so you can transcend those boundaries with the vehicle and get pretty close. And then suddenly somebody stands up and you're very close to the lion. And that lion's behavior is fight or flight. It needs to either defend itself or run away. Uh, invariably, they do move away, invariably. But suddenly you, you become this threat in a zone that you didn't go through all of those other zones before. The alert zone of lions, they'll be looking at you. You should be aware of lions if you're walking and you see them. From a distance, they'll be looking at you. Um, and then after that, they should make a noise. Uh, if you don't hear that, then they either didn't make the noise or you are deaf. And then after that, there's that potential for conflict. But there's many, many um, activities that take place before that happens. But, oh, this fellow... Now you can tell which direction the wind's coming from quite easily by the fact that he has just dropped a very friendly reminder of the fact that they have eaten. Oh my goodness. Where is dwarf sage when you need it? It's everywhere at the moment, but right here. I just need to move forward and through that water because the wind is blowing his giant poo directly towards us. Woo! Excuse me, everybody. I don't do very well with very bad smells. Goodness gracious. So that's one of the boys. So in the soft sand here where they're walking, you'll be able to see, I checked here this morning already, you'll be able to see all of the tracks on both sides of the road here. So we already drove around this block. So you would expect to see in these soft sandy bits uh, tracks. And this is all the alluvial soil that's been washed down from the road. So even with the sun baking and the, the hardening that happens to much of the soil, when it's very sandy like this and soft, you can expect to find a track. And um, these tracks, everybody, are very fresh. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to go around the corner here. It looks like the lines are slowly moving towards Tambeta Pan, and it sounds like Kyle has got some activity at a pan of his own. Well, just a very beautiful scene that we have got going here at our pan and the way that the sun is coming through the valley there and illuminating the northern facing slope of that mountain is just very beautiful it's very chilly here this morning i've got my jersey on and both myself and craig said yeah we should have brought a flask of tea out because it is very chilly The Kalahari slowly waking up. It's a very slow morning this morning. We went past the Meerkat Bar system. They have not emerged yet. And uh, obviously with this uh, delayed sunrise, I think they're also going to have a delayed start this morning. But a very pretty scene playing out in front of us here. And uh, we were actually just observing and appreciating these little new forms of life along the right-hand side of the pan. Egyptian geese have had new little goslings. 
above us. And this pen is very important for a lot of animals and animal activity. And there are tracks of cheetah that have come in here, but it looks like from yesterday. Looks like two males. Yes, Alison, it is picture perfect. Craig, go to the left. Sorry, sorry, folks, go to the left. Do you see the the, sh the small shrub-like tree in the water? Go, uh, go punch into that and then go to the bottom right-hand corner. It looks like the grebe is building a nest. What does he do? Just maintaining there. Do you see it? Bottom right-hand corner. It's just sitting under the foliage there on the bottom right-hand corner of that beautiful tree which is submerged under water at the moment. Looks like it's just maintaining something. And you just can't see perfectly what it is doing. Their nests are a floating uh, heap of plant material. That's typically what they would um, build. But it does look like this little bird's doing a little bit of maintenance around it, sitting nice and tight. See how it's pecking at the material on the left and right hand side of its breast. Almost an indication that it's getting ready to utilize the site, which would be phenomenal if we had a little grebe making a nest site here. Um, no, doesn't the nest float away when the current is high? So they would use vegetation, um, obviously um, anchoring the nest to vegetation, which is fairly stable. And there's no movement of uh, this water uh, in this pan. This water is fairly static. And uh, if I can see correctly, it looks like this little nest, if it is a nest, has been incorporated with one or two branches on the left-hand corner. Um, of the actual structure. We are a bit far away, so in picture it is very tiny. Um, but you can see that the bird is busy. It's sitting still and it is very, very busy around its body. There's a blacksmith lapwing coming in from the right. And we haven't actually done an update on those um, young individuals. We haven't been here for a couple of days. They must be sitting here somewhere. That would be phenomenal if this little grebe is um, nesting. That is always such a treat to find these birds through this period and observe them. Because some of them can be very, very, very sneaky. In some areas, um, if you go to the eastern part of the country, the density of these nest sites can be tremendous. Um, very, very high density through other areas of the country. Um, unlike here, where you, you wouldn't have a high density numbers at all. But we're going to continue observing over here for a little while. We'll send you off and we'll see you shortly. Have you been watching Wild Earth and dreamt of being right there on safari with one of the guides? Well, now you can. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to buy a ticket to dream. You or a friend can hop on board a live Wild Earth show and join our guide on safari. The ticket is redeemable at any of our locations, any time in the future. Only a limited number of tickets are available, so don't wait. Get your ticket now and start dreaming. Terms and conditions apply. What fascinates me most about the animal circle of life is the intricacies between the large and the very, very small. I mean, it's very easy to go out there and find the large. Once you find the large, the cascading effect down to the small absolutely fascinates me. 
alertness and situation awareness is by far the number one aspect for protecting ourselves out on safari. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. This is Rusty. He's my favorite vehicle and we've been through all the good times here in the bush. Now, if you feel a connection to Juma Game Reserve like I do, then we have a fantastic opportunity for you. You can have your name engraved on a brushed metal plaque just like this one and we will attach it to Rusty so you can always be with us on safari in spirit. We will even send you a digital photograph once your plaque is mounted on Rusty. Spaces are limited, so grab your spot now. Do you dream of travelling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. Well, as you can see, the Mulawati River is flowing, but it's it's starting to drop very, very, very quickly. Um, there is water that's moving, but it's not going to be um, flowing for much longer. I reckon if it stops raining within two days, we won't see, we'll see a trickle rather than this kind of proper flow that you're seeing now. Um, it's just kind of going over the road. If you look to the left, though, of where the flow is, and you look up on the bank, you can see where the grass has been flattened as to how high the river actually got at one point. Um, it's not that much higher. I'd say maybe another meter higher than what it is right now, um, which is not as much as I thought it would. Um, the Mulawati uh, has been much, much higher than this in, in 2012. Um, the basically to give you an idea of where the water was in 2012 as you see there's that sort of eroded section on the left hand side of that bush there's like a kind of sandy area um, so it was above that sandy section um, kind of going up the slope um, that was how high it was across here in 2012 so it's much much lower this year than it was I mean that's almost probably three times the depth of what it ran this year in comparison so it's not hugely full, but always nice to see the Mulawati flowing. You know, we don't have rivers um, in this part of the world. Uh, so it's always good when we get to see the water flowing in the drainage lines. Now, if you see a bit of fogging in the lens, um, unfortunately, with all the moisture we've got, there's no way to get rid of it. It's inside at the moment. Um, so it will eventually start to kind of dissipate as the temperatures rise and the kind of moisture starts to decrease but it's going to be a necessary evil for now um okay well we're going to cross the Malawati. we'll be fine to cross it's not deep at all in the meantime let's send you across to some beefy buffalo and see what they're getting up to welcome back to ambient panda we've been checking around the base of this mountain for any signs of that female leopard but so far nothing so we've moved a little bit further afield and we've found a herd of buffalo that has just started to wake up and they started to head out to go in search of food this is very close to where we saw that mother rhino and her calf yesterday evening the one that defecated in the road in front of us and again I spoke last night about the abundance of really good quality forage here, good quality grass and again just proof of the productivity of this area is the fact that there's a big herd of buffalo here as well lots of grazing animals there's some white rhino dung around us here as well so obviously quite a few rhinos that have been using this area too Let's 
still a few members of the herd that are taking their time before standing up and starting to move. They've no doubt been feeding throughout most of the early morning before sunrise. There's a couple of little calves in front of us there. Look at that one that's well, scratching its head there. Against the stick. They're leaving an itch. Looks like there's two calves there and they're both close to the same the same female that's lying down. But doubtless or highly unlikely that they're both from her. The one's probably from either the female that's now walking to the right or the female to the left of that group. Quite gross, <laughs> but um, quite interesting too, is Glenn and I were just talking now about how as these buffalo stood up, they started to, you could hear this like slapping sound that was from all of them defecating at the same time as they stood up. And that's something that's quite typical of buffalo after they've lain down to rest and then gotten up and started to to move. Um, you, you'll hear or, or see them, often the first thing they do is they, they defecate, they urinate, and then they start to move. So something that's often quite important when, when trying to track buffalo in terms of aging the tracks and trying to to figure out how long ago they were there or how far behind them you are, how fast they're moving is if you find all the dung are kind of clustered in one little area, there's a good chance that they were lying down and resting there and that you might then be able to gain a bit of time or gain a bit of ground on them. Tamsin, you're asking how big a buffalo herd can get. It can get pretty big. Often, well, at least here on Pillar, the biggest herd that I've seen is about 120 buffalo. But by buffalo herd standards, that's quite small. In, in parts of the Kruger, parts of northern Botswana, I've seen herds of sure hundreds maybe 200 300 400 and they can get even bigger than that and it's often when resources start to get scarce that the herds get bigger it sounds almost counterproductive you think if there's less food that you know that they spread out more but we often see during the dry season the dry times during winter that the herds kind of group together and they move between the last available sources of food. Also perhaps a response to, to predators. A bigger herd means more eyes, more ears, more noses to keep a, a lookout for danger. And so it should therefore be safer. But the herd looks like they're starting to move into this thicket on the right here. They seem to be grazing down the hill into the bottom of this valley. Apparently Steve has got a predator that would probably like to hunt these buffalo as they, as well, as they disappear head down, the, head down the hill. Let's go across to Steve, see what he's got for you. Mm, most certainly, Damien. This pride is an expert when it comes to... They are experts when it comes to buffalo hunting. And they've just been stopping and starting, stopping and starting. They all went off the road a little while ago and uh, slowly but surely individuals have been calling and finding their way back. There's a young boy who's coming in from the right chair. Yeah. It's always funny. The, the youngsters who keep losing themselves keep calling, but no one calls back. I'm just going to hit the road and be like, oh, there's everybody. He's behind us now, looking quite forlorn. Where's my family gone? I'm just going to hit the road. He's going to pick up on the smell and be like, oh, there you are. I'll be able to hear the black crowned chagra calling very loudly. It's been a light pitter patter of rain since we went out, but it doesn't seem to be continuing much at the moment, but uh, everything's steaming up. And uh, I don't know for how long 
We're going to be able to follow these lines. So heading all the way to the bottom there, that is the road for Twin Dams that goes in to the Milwati. And if they do go even onto that road, it seems like they might be going onto the road. And if they go towards the river, well, that will be the end of it for us. But we've had a splendid start to the morning, nevertheless. A beautiful Talamati parade. Lucas, I don't actually know. I mean, I think the Unkuhumas is probably the largest pride. But um, over the years, definitely in the time I've been here, the Unkuhumas is the largest pride in this area. But that obviously ebbs and flows with the males being there or not. 16 on its own, 18 with the two males, 19 with the three males. We've still got two lonely fellows behind us. It was so funny, I saw that young male come out before, and had a little, a little tongue sticking out of his mouth. He's like, everybody's left me behind. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, the, the 18 is, is big for these areas. And the Talamatis is a big pride as well. There's 14 of them without any adult males. That's a, it's a lot of lions, you know. We often will find a pride that gets above 10. Ooh. Oh, no. Okay, well, before we get too much in the smells of what I just smelled, let's see any of Tristan who's got a feathered friend. Well, we can see we're doing a spot of birding. I'm actually surprised how few raptors we've seen this morning sitting on these trees, given the conditions that we currently um, have here. Um, it seems like it would be a lot more of them that would just be kind of taking it easy and trying to somehow um, dry off after days of very wet weather. Um, but there's not been very many bar this battle here who's always in this area. These, this is a pair that nests um, very, very close to one of the boundaries. We see them pretty much uh, every time you drive here, you can find these guys. Uh, so we have documented them a lot. Uh, but it's been nice to follow them, their journey, and see how often they're nesting, and to kind of pick them up um, regularly is always a good thing, because outside of these protected areas, like here, um, Batadiers actually aren't all that common. Um, they have unfortunately been quite heavily uh, persecuted, not for target, well, not generally targeted, but they suffer the effects of farmers poisoning carcasses when they have predators that are hunting them. Because they're a carrion feeder, they land and they feed off those carcasses that are poisoned and unfortunately uh, die from that. So their numbers have declined drastically um, because of it outside of areas that are, are protected. Um, inside the protected areas, they, they're doing okay. Um, their numbers are, are pretty steady. But just getting back to what Steve was saying with, with in terms of large prides, um, he was saying the Nkumas are the biggest in this area, but th there's actually two other prides that are, are bigger than the Nkumas. We don't see them, but they are on the fringes of, of the Nkuma and Talamati territories. The one is the pride to the north called the Naru pride. Um, the last I heard, they were, they were close to 20. Um, and then the Insevu or Kambula pride to our south, I think is 21 or 22 now. Um, so, you know, there are two very large prides on either side of the Talamatis and Inkuhumas. Um, but in terms of the prides we see, the Inkuhuma, um are bigger. Although, you know, that's a, a very loose statement to say that we see the Inkuhumas these days because we don't. Um, they are hardly ever um, around Juma. And this is not an uncommon thing to see pride dynamics shift and change. It often is variable due to, to male influence. Um, you know, you see the sticks and how they've changed their territories. Um, we were talking the other day about sort of my favorite prides that I've followed and I was, I was mentioning the Salada Breakaways and the Mangan females. Um, and they used to be all over this area and now we don't see, you know, any sign of the Mangan pride. Um, so the territories change and the alliances shift as their new males come in and that then means that you start to see a drifting and a changing of the, the territories of the lions themselves. 
Um, they don't always stay in the exact same place. And who knows, you know, maybe a new coalition comes through and the, the Nkumas come running back up this way. Uh, you don't know. Um, but it will be interesting kind of either way to see if the Talamatis continue to spend more time on Juma um, and the Nkumas less time like they have. Anyway, it sounds like Kyle's got something interesting. So let's send you across to a dry swalu, uh, or drier swalu, and see uh, what he's got. Well, welcome back. We have just taken the corner around this pan and we have seen a subtle sign left behind, more than likely by a hooved ungulate or two. If you guys look at the trees in frame, the one on the right hand side, you can see that the grassy area that is um, casing the tree itself, um, you can see the grass has all been flattened. And when it comes to reading tracks and signs, these signs left behind are not always you know, very subtle. I mean, sorry, not always very prominent, but are sometimes very subtle and very, very hard to read. But over here, we can see that all the grass has been flattened, giving us a very clear indication that somebody found this to be a suitable rest spot for last night. More than likely, in a wildebeest or maybe even an eland came in here and had found this spot to be absolutely perfect and decided to rest here. So you can see that all the grass is just flat and beautifully and there's a very distinctive flat and then raised section to the back there. Um, when you look at that, that uh, format, you can also use that to track animals if you're in a very grassy area or like we have now, where the grass is dominating certain areas. So looking and finding a track with on the sand is a very hard thing. So what we rely on now is when animals are moving from point A to point B, we are relying on the grass and the way that it is bent um, to give us a general direction of where this animal might have gone. So utilizing all aspects and utilizing all these tools is a very, very efficient way of finding animals. And also it really enriches your experience being out in the bush, understanding all these, um, these differences and all these little signs left behind by animals so more than likely just a hooved ungulate finding a rest spot up on the tree there, there's the wider um just through the gap just underneath the canopy the far end let me just we've got a very beautiful bird here in the distance here pintailed wider uh, sorry prr, listen to me shaft held wider and that was a male there that just took off very very quickly they are very dominant of in a certain area and that male has been calling out continuously here um, but yeah we will take a look out for him but we're going to send you over to Damien which he's got some tiny insects for you guys Welcome back to Ambient Pinda. We haven't gone too far from where those buffalo crossed over the road and we've just come across this incredible explosion of termite alates, which are the winged reproductive bodies of a termite colony. So all of these little, see all these, all those kind of like orangey, whitish little termites that are swarming around there, coming out of the little holes in the ground. And then there's those much larger termites with the wings. So all coming out of the same little holes in the ground. And it's these, these winged ones that are especially interesting to us because they're flying all over the place and there's birds that are swooping in and catching them. In fact, what alerted us initially to the presence of this explosion of termite alates was a, a common buzzard that was sitting at the entrance of the of the termite colony and just kind of like picking them out as they came out the ground. Look at that, all of them flying off into into the sky there. Quite bold for them to be emerging at this time of day. There's a lot of birds that will relish the chance to feed on these on these on these flying termites. Super rich in protein and fat, really good food source. A lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the migratory birds that come down here from, from Europe and Asia um, come down here to specifically feed on these, 
on these termite alates and on other insects that become abundant during the summer months here in southern Africa. But yeah, obviously with all the heavy rain that we've had, the soil will be, will, will be nice and soft now. And so it's ideal for these termites to leave their colonies and fly out. And there'll be several, or, all, or most of the colonies in this area will also be producing, presumably, or releasing their, their winged reproductive bodies. And then hopefully the termites from here will find termites from another colony and they'll be able to, to breed and then start new colonies. Just amazing though, looking at them all coming out of the ground. And I've been hearing quite a few pinda rain frogs calling in the background. I don't know if you can hear, there's that high pitched sound that almost sounds like a bell ringing. Not, not that that was just calling now, that was a long billed crombeck that there's a that's the rain frog. And I've spoken a couple of times about how I'd love to show all of you one and because of how elusive they can be and how they typically call where they sit at a, they sit normally in some, in, in, in pretty dense cover and then call from there where it's hard to see them. Often the best way to get a view of them is to actually come and sit at, a, at, at a, the entrance to a termite colony, especially when these termite alates are coming out. And often the frogs will gather around and then also just like that step, like that uh, common buzzard was doing, they'll gather the alates as they come out. But I'm, I'm amazed that there aren't more birds around this particular, around this, this, this particular entrance. But I think that there's so many entrances currently with so many termites flying out. There's only so many termites that the birds can eat. So perhaps another survival strategy of these termites is that if they all kind of fly out at once, the odds of you getting eaten are, are a bit less. Good survival strategy. Almost just satiating the predators, flooding the market with food, so to speak. Really amazing to see. I think Lynn and I are going to leave these termite alates. We're going to keep on heading down the road, see what else we can find for you. Let's go across to Juma. Apparently Tristan's got a roadblock in front of him. Not only impalas, but guinea fowls with their little chicks. Um, you can just see the little babies underneath the adults over there, which is always cool. Uh, as well as a bit of sunshine and a kind of misty feel to everything. So it's it's a bit of kind of, well, a lot happening all at once, really. Um, I must admit, I'm a bit jealous of uh, the winged alits hatch because it, it is incredible to watch when those alits come out and all the birds come in. You get crazy interactions um, when you have all those birds around. So it's going to be very cool to see um, what birds show up because sometimes you'll even get uh, huge amounts of birds of prey coming through. Uh, aim of falcons and the likes. I often like to feed off winged termites uh, as well as some of the sparrow hawks. Um, so hopefully they'll kind of uh, make an appearance. Anyway, um, our guinea fowl and impalas, I think everybody is just breathing a sigh of relief that for uh, a first time in kind of three and a half days that the the sun is sort of peaked through a little bit and that it's not raining. Um, it's dry for now, it, it's, it's fairly warm and I think everybody's just on the roads just trying to kind of stay out of the wet grass. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more signs of cats. Uh, I haven't seen, a, I've, well, I have seen tracks. I saw tracks for a mating pair of lions. Um, they were actually seen yesterday afternoon on this road and they went into Arethusa, unfortunately. But other than that, I haven't seen a single leopard track, um, only one set of hyena tracks, and I would have thought there would have been more. With the, the, way, the way the vegetation is so soggy and wet and um, I would have far, thought that a lot of the animals would have been on road networks um, more than, than kind of in the bush and try and utilize those drier surfaces of the sand r rather than lying in wet, slushy, um, muddy grass. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they like it that way. Who knows? 
Kendra, it depends where you are in the world. Um, impala horns vary um, depending on the areas that you're in. So here in South Africa, our impalas, the horns don't get very big at all. Um, they, not comparatively speaking, um, and the reason is quite interesting, we'll get into it now, but in East Africa, um, the size of impala horns is massive. They have huge... Um, horns uh, in comparison um, and the reason why their horns have developed so much larger is because unlike our um, impalas that go through a rut um, the impalas up in East Africa are mating all year round and because of that it means that their horns have developed to be much bigger and larger um, so they've evolved to have these larger sets um, that are used more regularly whereas ours tend to be a little bit smaller because they're only used um, at certain times of the year. In terms of how big they can actually get, um, you know, most horn sizes um, are measured in inches. Um, so like an average or well, good sized Impala Ram would be kind of like 20 to 25 inches. But I think the record, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong, is in the 30s, um, early 30s, mid 30s, somewhere there. Um, which is quite long for a set of horns. Um, it's, it's not a small amount at all. Now, I'm sorry that the lens looks like it's all misty. It's not misty like this at the moment. Uh, that's unfortunately due to the amount of moisture that we've had. There's clearly moisture that has seeped into the lens itself. And with the sun coming out and it heating up, that's causing a misting effect inside. And there's nothing that Simpor can do, no matter how much he wipes that lens we're not going to be able to get rid of it. So it's going to feel very misty um, from Rusty this morning. It's not going to change at all. Um, it'll have to dry out, so we'll need a bit of good sunshine uh, just to kind of get rid of that misting that's taking place. It's not ideal because generally with cameras and lenses, you don't really want any misting on the internal side of the lens because that can cause fungus to grow, funny enough, and can mess up um, things quite quickly, which is, which is crazy. So we'll maybe try and see if we can get it into some desiccant or something during the course of the day to get rid of that moisture and draw it out. Cool little sighting this though. I'm enjoying the kind of male uh, impalas just sort of clashing horns every now and then, a little yawn here and there, and then the, the guinea fowl in the background for once being quiet, um, and they're little ones that are sort of bouncing about in the background. Oh, hello brown-headed parrots. Some brown-headed parrots calling to our left-hand side. I must admit it is super peaceful out here this morning. I haven't seen a single car. It's kind of fresh and clean. It's actually a really nice morning to be out. Anyway, we're going to carry on bumbling. I'm going to go check the Mulawanini now and hopefully that's also still flowing and we'll be able to kind of show you guys what that looks like. You're back with us here at Ambion Pinda and we haven't managed to get very far from that explosion of Timal Alat because we've just seen a yellow built kite and Glenn's doing a phenomenal job of keeping it in frame because it's moving around quite quickly and quite erratically. It's flying over a, a little termite alat emergence and it's using its talons to grab tal um, termites individually. It's flying up and it kind of like sticks its talon out and grabs one and then transfers it from its talon to its beak. Flies to the next one, grabs it. There we go. It happens so subtly and so easily. And there were initially two yellow billed kites here as well as a common buzzard, all three of them doing the same thing. And like I mentioned earlier, these these terminal alleys just full of, of fat and protein, super nutritious, really good food source for, for many of the bird species out here. And especially for these, for these for, for migratory birds like, like this yellow billed kite that have invested a lot of energy to fly all the way down here from, from further north in Africa, just south of the Sahara, and then to have to fuel up to get ready to, to do that same journey again. Very important that they get a good, they get good quality food while they're down here, and good amounts of food to build up body condition before they 
make the great trick back. It's amazing the accuracy though of this kite. It makes it look so easy. I haven't seen it miss once. And you think about it like, I mean, it's, it's using its talons. So it's like trying to grab those termite alates between its fingers, basically. It's not like it's got a net, like a night jar's mouth or something to catch these termites with. What an epic sight. sunshine was short-lived it's already gone and it looks like it might start raining again soon um, the clouds are starting to get dark again that's okay it's still pretty out at the moment um, we're not too far from the Mulawanini now uh, we should be able to see it fairly soon um, I don't think this one will be flowing too much but what does happen at the Mulawanini which is really cool compared to the Mulawati um, is that the Mulawanini often when it runs it causes spawning of catfish and so you can find catfish on the main road um, spawning on the the gravel bed that's created by the road itself um, so we'll just go and have a little look now they either do it here or they do it at Chitwa Dam when we, that overflows um, but Chitwa I don't think is open I haven't been able to get hold of anybody to find out what's actually going on there and whether we can drive on the road so I'm not going to even try like I say this is an exploratory run on the boundaries um, more than it's a proper adventure Jim the roads aren't too bad here um, in places they've been quite badly eroded um, and kind of washed but not anything too crazy I mean we haven't seen a lot of the roads yet we'll, we'll kind of as we start to open the reserve out we'll, we'll get a better idea um, but you know not driving them will have helped a lot to keep the road in a better condition you can see on the edges here there is a lot of kind of runoff that's taken place and erosion a lot of you often ask why we have these kind of bumps in the road and and that's specifically to protect the road so that we don't get too much wash away um, from you know this area or from the water kind of flowing down the slope so it hits here and you can kind of see in front of me it comes down and and this bolster here or this bump is not very a very kind of big one and so the water's managed to bypass it on the right hand side and cause a furrow to develop so that's what you're trying to avoid is you're trying to have a bump and then on the bump is a cut that's supposed to take place and the cut goes into the bush and so as the water comes down it hits the bump and then it furrows it well it funnels it should I say towards the the mitre drain and then that goes into the bush back where it belongs rather than on the road itself and, and because it goes into the bush all the grasses and trees and all those kinds of things and absorb it um, and hold the soil together much better than a clean surface um, and so you're getting this kind of eroded sections on the side but it's really not bad compare this to to you know um, outside of the reserve i believe the roads outside are very very bad and and then you compare south africa to mozambique which is i mean the roads in mozambique were really really damaged um, a lot went on there but funnily enough it wasn't as bad as the the cyclone they got last year which we didn't really feel too much of the effects of um, i think it was ida was its name um, that really hammered mozambique a lot more than this one did it's not to say that this one didn't cause a lot of damage and even loss of life it did which is something we always need to remember you know we we sit here and we complain about being wet on a game drive but you know people lost their homes and their lives which is always a sad part about these things and a difficult part to to kind of manage and we're very lucky that we do have a lot of land between us and the ocean which means we don't get hit nearly as hard Corgo, um, in terms you don't really get um, massive illnesses that develop in this kind of weather so things like anthrax are more prevalent in dry conditions um, when spores are, are kicked up and, and made available by animals going to and from the same water point digging for water they 
activate those spores. Um, what you do get a lot of here, I'm going to stop up the slope because we lose signal a little bit as we go down there. So I'm just going to stop up here where we do have signal so you can see the Mulawanini. It's not flowing very much at all, actually. It's, it's a gentle trickle. Um, and so, you know, what they do get in this is... is Deaths occur due to to cold. Um, so when you go from temperatures of 35 to 40 degrees Celsius, or you know 100 Fahrenheit, and that drops overnight with wet weather to something like 20 degrees Celsius, or you know maybe 60 Fahrenheit, it causes shock, particularly to young animals and birds. Um, you find a lot of the time if we get very little sun um, you, and, and cold weather and rainy weather, things like swallows, um, those small little birds that survive every day just by flying around and collecting their food and they can't do that, they can die from, from basically malnutrition and therefore and then cold that sets in afterwards. But in impalas and, and things like that, very young animals can suffer cold shock um, or heat shock if it changes the other way very, very fast um, and unfortunately can succumb to that. But illness-wise, nothing really um, that you see too much out here. Animals are resilient, you know, they, they've lived for many, many years in these conditions um, and the strongest always survive and that means that, you know, they've built up a, a, an ability to cope um, with with bad weather, whether it be hot drought conditions or, um, you know, uh, wet rainy flooding conditions they figure a way out i mean there's always going to be one or two that are going to lose their life due to something that's taken place if it's extreme on both sides um, but in most cases their bodies are pretty resilient to rain and and um and to to cold cooler weather should we say i mean it's not really cold if we're honest at you know 24 25 degrees celsius is not exactly freezing um so these guys are just fine they They'll be okay. We won't find too much of that. Um, and then, like I say, there's not like they get the sniffles or the flu or something. Um, they generally are okay. Um, just damp and miserable more than anything else. But no catfish, unfortunately, today. I was hoping we were going to see them kind of... Because you often find them on that little concrete slab that you see there. And they'll kind of shuffle through that concrete slab um, and then lay eggs. And then, then the, the males will kind of deposit sperm um, over those eggs. It's common to see fish um, spawning on gravel beds. Um, but it doesn't look like the rivers flowed enough to get the catfish up this end um, so it doesn't seem like they're around maybe they're at the outflow at Chitwa. okay let's carry on let's go and see what else we can find I'll bumble along here maybe Tundi and or Tundi's cub is sitting in a tree somewhere um, in this area we'll just have a little look and then we'll carry on but it sounds like Carl's got some cool things and uh, send you across to him Well, thank you, Tristan, and how lucky are we? Myself and Craig were discussing, obviously, with the overcast and coolish conditions that we are experiencing today on Swalu, what are the chances that we would find this beautiful little Makala group of meerkats? And we took a chance. We walked in the block and we saw a little head and we rushed to the vehicle to get you folks. We have one individual out busy scouting the area. Just making sure that you oh, see something. What does he see? But yeah, what a treat and how lucky are we. So in overcast and very cool conditions, meerkats are really taking a risk at coming out. Because they're tiny little bodies, they lose so much heat to the environment. Unlike an elephant, for example, which doesn't really have to worry about losing body heat. Um, this little animal's body is obviously now working overtime to ensure that, you know, homeostasis is maintained. And um, if you think, like we've been looking at, if you look at their general feeding behavior, they have to feed all day. So in conditions like this, you know, it's a touch and go um, decision. Whereas, and if we are going to have rain, these animals would not come out the burrows. If it was a, bit, a slightly drizzly now, or if 
yeah, it was a bit colder, they would opt to rather stay at this burrow system where they are warm. But then it is a massive catch-22 because by them staying in this burrow and not going out and foraging, they would lose a lot of body mass. In a day, they could lose a good percentage of body mass if we had prevailing unfavorable conditions. But for right now, it is just slightly overcast and it is it is perfect for them to be outside and hopefully we can... They are very cute little animals. Lovely comment there. Um, they are just so all-rounded um, is in terms of a cute animal. Um, and then they have the sociability that just fits hand in hand with their appearance. Being very, very social little animals. We, uh, we really enjoy watching meerkats because of their sociability. They're by far one of the most social animals that we have. Oh, I thought we were going to have a staring competition there. He broke away first. So these are two adults that are out. And um, typically early morning they want the sun. Because if you think about um, how cool it is underground, you know, a meter and a half underground, it is fairly um, cool conditions. And now early morning there, the first order of business would be to warm up. And you can see they're hunched over a position. They're trying to retain body heat. One on the right hand side, yeah, Craig's showing a sign to dig. He's saying, oh, oh, he's got something. I'm not waiting for the sun. I'm going to start feeding. Lauren, um, what do meerkats eat? Well, meerkats eat a wide variety of insects, invertebrates. Let me say that that's better, it's better suited. So they would eat beetles, the larva of beetles, they would eat scorpions, they would eat uh, crickets. Um, I've seen them feed at a certain period of the year, feed um, quite a lot on these armored ground crickets that we have out at the moment. So all types of creepy crawlies they would eat and that's also why I think people love them so much is because they eat all the creepy crawlies but um, a very wide range of invertebrates spiders scorpions geckos and lizards if they can catch them um, and they've got the dental structure that obviously enables them to to feed on that food source if you think about carnivores across Africa people you know in general think about a carnivore and you just think big you know massive teeth very big body weight but if you look at the a large majority, a very large portion of the carnivore order is actually very small to medium-sized animals. And obviously being a carnivore, you are consuming other organisms for your sustenance. But uh, the digging behavior is what that enables them to find these um, <laughs> little critters under the ground. of communication going on here with the two of them in front of us. Yeah, so where we get a, a good view on the claws, we'll, we'll definitely point out the length of the claws of these tiny little animals. See that tail almost erect vertically. They are very curious little animals, um, especially young ones. Um, young ones in the beginning stages when they are still getting used to us. Whoa, there comes a mecca from that side. Where does that individual come from? Um, in the beginning, when we have new individuals from a colony, they are just so curious about our presence. Obviously, older members are like, oh, we know human beings, but the new ones have this fixation of trying to get as close as possible 
and they had this very, very curious posture and demeanor about them, you know, cautiously approaching, but still trying to understand us and what we are doing here. What a beautiful scene. I absolutely love the patterning on the back of these animals. That beautiful stripe pattern that they have. Obviously aiding in camouflage when the animal is busy feeding. Because the animals, it walks on all fours. And it only stands upright like it vertically on its hind legs when it is trying to gain a bit of height to scan for predators or to locate colony um, members. Um, but when it's walking on all fours, that stripy pattern that you're seeing there um, allows this animal to somewhat blend into the, its environment. Because their biggest threat would be from above. Aerial predators such as raptors would be their biggest threat. Not too sure where that other meerkat came from. And we've only seen three here. Should be a few more. So this but there he comes. Oh. <laughs> So, Craig, if you can get in nice and close on that animal's claws, we can see how long those claws are, and those are very efficient tools. Oh, and he's gone. So their claws are about two odd centimeters long. That is very long. And that's a very useful tool and how, a very useful tool that these animals would use to unearth those insects. And they are very efficient diggers. I have... Uh, done a little investigation on a few dig sites um, with my time here in Swalu and I've found a meerkat would dig itself to where you cannot see it anymore. You can't see its tail, you can't see any movement of swell, nothing. To where the meerkat moved off, I put my hand down the burrow and it literally went up to the top part of my shoulder. So literally my entire arm was under the ground. And that little meerkat must have excavated that dig site in a few minutes. So very efficient ability uh, to unearth its prey. Vigilance is key. And everybody would be vigilant, but you would have one individual taking this role very, very seriously. Early morning, if you have a partner that can check your six, it's very, very good. So everybody's on high alert coming out these burrows because animals will actually wait out at these burrow entrances for the emergence of a meerkat. And as the meerkat emerges, pow, he has another two of you. Oh, wow, they're all coming out now. Morning, guys. <laughs> Excuse me. So African wildcat would be an animal that would do that, sit and wait at a burrow entrance. And uh, not a nice thing to see, but then that's what needs to happen. And I've seen meerkats turn on African wildcat. We found an African wildcat using a, bu a burrow system of a meerkat colony, and this colony picked up the scent. Um, of this little African wildcat. It was actually a baby. And they went down the spiral system and pulled it out and the whole colony made sure th that they showed this little one and how disappointed they were. Unfortunately for the little African wildcat, it, 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 uh, it passed away. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a give and take out here. coming up from the east and these clouds are rolling over us
certainly it is such a treat to be in such close proximity to animals like this. Um, as you folks would know, respect and obviously ensuring the safety is number one for me. You never ever broach on on breaking the lines. But uh, being this close where we've built this relationship over the past couple of years, it is such a wonderful thing to experience. Well, uh, we're going to continue sitting with this lovely group of meerkats. We're going to send you off to Tristan. He's got something with spots. Indeed, we have spots, not just one spot, but two spots. We have Kuchava and the Cub. I think it's Kuchava and the Cub. It's a long distance view for now, but it looks like them. It's definitely not Tundi and Cub, um, but it's exactly where Tundi's Cub has been left over the last few weeks um, on the Muluwanini. We kind of just spotted them from afar on the rocks, and we won't be able to go any further uh, than where we are right now, but at least it's a view of some welcome spots and two very very cool spots because <laughs> they're uh, spots that we don't see as regularly it looks like them isn't it it is them i mean i don't have my binos with me so i'm struggling to see nicely but it definitely looks like Kuchava and the cub um unfortunately like i say i can't off-road so i can't get to where they are um, but they're in the Mulawanini heading towards the main road. So I'm going to just turn around and we're going to go wait on the main road. Um, there's no other way that I can actually um, see them. Uh, there's, this is just the reality of what it's going to be like over the course of the next few weeks. Um, although I'm surprised, I was, I was just talking about it now to um, Paul on camera, saying to him that I'm very, very surprised at how well drained a lot of the roads are, how things look okay. They're not as bad as I thought they would be. I thought we would see a lot more devastation on the roads. And I think it's just because one is that it's, um, while it has rained a lot, the rain wasn't pounding um, storm. It was more kind of soft soaking rain um, to start with. And secondly, not a lot of cars are around because um, um, you know, the, the lodges themselves aren't as busy as they normally are, and I think the roads just haven't been churned up uh, like they normally would have been. Uh, so everything's actually looking pretty good. Um, it's pretty much how it would have looked if we had just had sort of 40 mils, 50 mils of rain in one big crashing storm. Um, but either way, super exciting that we've managed to at least get visual of these two cats i'm going to try and get them from the main road it's going to be very tricky um but given that the mulawati is running i'm hoping going to walk along the bank and we'll eventually get them on uh, gari main again and we'll get to see them there either way though we got a spot for a little bit um <laughs> Crazy to think that we managed to actually find spots in what we have at the moment. It's not exactly um, easy to be in game drives, and, and, and you know, you've just got to get very lucky when it comes to the leopards now. They've just got to be walking somewhere where you can see them. And I actually wasn't going to go to where they to those rocks, but I, the road looked okay and it was kind of fairly rocky. So I thought, well, you know what, let's check quickly to see if the cub is around. Um, but Well, welcome back. Sorry about that. That's all good. You are with us. We are still sitting with these lovely little mere chaps. And I really, in my tummy, I don't think that these individuals will move off today. With these conditions that I am seeing from the east here, yeah, I think it is just too much of a risk for them to move off and go and feed. So as I said, they would go for beetles, they'd go for larva, termites, grasshoppers, lizards, like skinks, they would eat that. Um, but then also I've read along the lines, they also go for even eggs and, uh, and as well as chicks. And then from time to time, they'll also dabble in a little bit of fruit. Uh, so they've got a fairly <laughs> varied diet, but definitely the carnivorous instinct is a very, very strong thing with them. So mainly eating other animals. And if one of them yawns, you'll see that they've got fairly large canines to grab hold and obviously tackle prey in the correct manner. Mm -hmm. 
I'm still waiting for the day that a that a warthog pops out behind them and we get a shot of a warthog and a meerkat together. Craig's not even smiling. He's like, oh my gosh, I want it. <laughs> Keeping a very low profile there. So even the animal in that position is being efficient on conserving body heat. If you think about the wind that we are receiving now, it's coming from the east, but if you're standing directly in that wind, you're going to be losing a lot of body heat. But if you are crouched down and you're utilizing vegetation, the wind is not um, taking away body heat in a very fast manner. So you are conserving and slowing down that process. Or conserving the heat, but then slowing down heat loss. So the more heat they lose, the quicker that they need to eat. And if they can't go out and forage, it's not going to be very good for them. So they need to be very, very clever and very careful. And that's where I have a lot of respect for animals because they really do fight for survival every single day. So it wouldn't be a proper drive if it wasn't for a leopard air, especially from Tristan. <laughs> it wouldn't be a proper safari live drive. Holding another one there. It's holding from the hindquarters. I would really want the wheel be cross. Is it trying? The clock is holding the tail. It's holding tight. Oh no. Goodness me. Lucky, lucky wildebeest. You have another day to leave. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows, and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. Our first Wild Earth Explorers competition has closed. And we have a winner. Congratulations to Chantal Sleep from Benoni in South Africa. I felt totally overwhelmed for winning this prize. I will be taking my son with me and I can't wait to share this experience with him. Chantal and her son have won a behind-the-scenes Wild Earth experience at the magnificent and beyond Ngala Tented Safari Camp. The prize includes a three-night stay and a chance to sleep out in the unique Ngala treehouse. I would like to thank Wild Earth for making this dream come true. And I encourage everybody to subscribe, to become an explorer, and stand the chance to win these amazing prizes and so much more. For this month, we have a brand new prize. You could be jetting off to Tualu in the Kalahari for a three-night stay at the luxurious Motsi Lodge open to all Wild Earth explorers who have signed up before the end of January 2021. Terms and conditions apply. Hi, I'm Kyle and I come to you live every day here from Tuali Kalahari in South Africa. My favorite bird has to be the social weaver, the enormous nest that they create, their survival tactics to inhabit these harsh and unforgiving environments and as well as their complex social arrangements is truly remarkable and the interconnectedness with the ecosystem shows us that we are too. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. So how efficient these animals are at foraging, when they are foraging, the animal can shift its own weight in soil in under, in under a minute. And then if you look at the 
the rate at which these animals would feed on available items, they, an, an adult would make about 30 kills, 30 kills of, well, 30 meals, let's say that, per hour. That is a very, very fast rate at which these animals are digging and unearthing their prey. And to think about the animal weighing at about 900 grams, shifting 900 odd grams in under a minute is a remarkable ability. But now, obviously, just scanning and scouting and making sure everybody's safe is, is what they really need to be doing. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Laughing down, calling in the distance. Fulbe, what a fantastic question. How long do meerkats live for? So, Fulbe, uh, looking at their general size, they would have an average lifespan. And if you look at across the board, um, meerkats have a lifespan of between 8 and 10 years. Some of them um, can live to a bit longer, but if we're looking at a general give and take of how long a meerkat can live for, it's about 8 to 10 years. In captivity, they obviously can live a little bit longer, so when there's no sneaky predators around them, they can live to a ripe old age of 12 up to about 15. I've also read it into a few um, books. But 8 to 10 is the general give and take lifespan of these beautiful little animals. And I mean, to think about all that activity on a day-to-day -day basis, 8 to 10 years, that's a lot of wear and tear on joints. And you'd find that older individuals actually suffer quite a lot from, from joint pains in their old age. Think about that digging every day, all day. I mean, unearthing 30 individual items in under an hour, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of work. So their joints just take a beating. Oh, you cold buddy. So get you a blanket. See, as the breeze came up, the animal went down. And now that the breeze has gone through, it's now sat back up. So this is the Makala group. We haven't seen the, the rock star group for a little while. So I think in the upcoming days we will go and visit the rock star group and go do a little update. But we're going to send you off to uh, the Leopard Whisperer with some spots. Well, as you can see, we've got Kuchava and the Cub on the road. Somehow we've managed to get them. They're crossing off the road now. We've had them for a few minutes. Um, and this brief visual is pretty much what we're going to get. I'm going to try and see if I can get a little bit closer to them and see if we can get them um, again. They Obviously, we can't off-road, but they are flirting with the roads. And so if we just keep in the area, we should be able to kind of maintain some sort of visual of them. Um, I mean, it's not going to be easy, that's for sure, but at least we're kind of getting something on them. Where did you guys go now? Uh, there they are. There. So, and Paul says he can see them. I can't see them nicely because of the, the way that the sort of grass sits, but they're just in front of us here. So what I'm hoping is that I'm going to see her coming to our left, because if she moves towards the left, she's moving towards the main road. Um, and we can maybe get them there. Uh, she's scent marking a little bit, but it's definitely her and the cub, that's for sure. All right, well, I'll try and see if we can get them. They're going into a better area for us. Um, in the meantime, though, let's send you back across to Carl and the meerkats. I know, I know that Tristan will find that leopard again. 
So it's quite a small group that we're looking at. I think there's under 10 individuals in this group. I think they're around about seven now. But generally, you're looking at group members uh, within a general colony. It could be 8 to 15. That's the general give and take of a group. But then you can have very large groups of numbering nearly 40 individuals within a colony. Uh, but when it comes to that size of a group, um, when, it, you know, when you are busy foraging, vocal communication does become a very big problem. And if you can't stay in vocal communication with one another, that means that you could potentially be caught. So when a group gets to that size, you'll have smaller groups uh, branching off from their, their natal group and um, in the hopes of establishing and um, yeah, establishing a new colony. Uh, you would never find a meerkat by itself. You would, but then it's a very tricky period in which it is in. Meerkats don't live by themselves. They are social creatures. Just like us, they need each other, as do we. Um, they need each other to have a fruitful and a safe lifestyle. Um, so members, obviously, it's a very, very important point of safety. Uh, but then also for the social aspect, it is great. Hello. Beautiful trivulus in the left hand side of that meerkat. Those beautiful yellow flowers. Liam, I would have to say the story I mentioned earlier of the meerkats. It is harsh, you know, looking at something being killed, but it is by far, it is raw. It is what it is. Um, so memorable, but I think the most learning part of it was that these little guys won't take a lot of nonsense. So I'd have to say the meerkat and a baby African wildcat sighting that we had, I'd have to be the most... Yeah, it would have to be the highlight of my sightings with meerkats. And then I've also seen them, I've also seen them take out a few scorpions. They can be very, very um, skillful when dealing with a very dangerous item like that. And watching them, you know, find the weak points and nipping at it um, is very entertaining. Unfortunately for the scorpion, not so much, but um, understanding how these animals interact with each other and how things work is a very, very beautiful thing for me. I don't know if I, if I don't have a heart, but I don't see it as like, I feel sorry for an animal when it dies. I feel almost like it happens. For me, I've got a very logic way of thinking in the bush. I don't feel with, I don't think with emotion. I do, but I don't. And I think logic overrides everything in me to say that it is natural and it is what it needs to happen. And Nikonova, yes, uh, they are territorial. That's a very good question. Uh, meerkats are very territorial, so you'll find that group members. Uh, demarcated territories via a specialized scent which this group would have a common scent and that uh, s that scent is produced from a specialized anal gland found at the rear of this animal and if uh, a group member had to wander in to um, a new territory or if an individual had been broken away from the group or if he had been driven out and he had to wander into a an opponent's territory these individuals will act aggressively and uh, the alpha male would definitely be the one in the forefront of that charge um, but colonies do clash you'd find that there would be a lot of visual display first and then you normally have groups going their own way but you can have the instances where they do fight and they can be quite, quite vicious uh, using claws um, and then using the teeth always visual first always visual you want to try and deter your opponent without engaging in conflict and then unfortunately if the visual aspect doesn't work then they will put the gloves on so to say their tiny little boxing gloves 
Um, so yeah, so group, group members can be quite aggressive to um, other groups. Because if you think about the territory is everything, is everything to these animals. It is their available resources which give them the comfortable lifestyle. Um, and obviously the stronger the group, the more dominant the territory that they would be in, or the healthier the territory that they would be in. So you don't want anybody coming in freeloading on your on your space, so to say. But we're going to enjoy the chilly conditions here for a little while, but we're going to send you over to Damien. He's got you guys an eagle. You're back with us here at Ambion Pinda. And it seems like Glenn and I can't get away from these termite alerts today. We've just found another massive emergence where there's maybe a couple of holes there because it seems like there's termites flying up from the ground in a couple of different places there. And there's a Warburg's eagle that has been basically standing over the hole. And it's just, every time a termite alert flies up off the ground, it just grabs it and eats it. And it's been here for maybe the last 10 minutes or so absolutely gorging itself and if you look very carefully right now that it's standing with its head up a little bit look at its chest see how pronounced it is it's quite a big bulge there and that, that's how full its crop is its crop is rapidly filling up with um with termite alerts almost like a like a lion or a, or a leopard's belly after they've gorged themselves on on a carcass But there's just so many termite alerts there that that one eagle is not really going to make a dent in, in the in the population. There's also two hardy dars, two hardy dar ibises that are just behind the eagle, keeping their distance from it. They're also picking up alerts individually and feeding on them. Lisa, you're saying it looks like a feast for the eagle? Most definitely, Lisa. This is, yeah, like I said, this is the eagle equivalent of a pride of lions on a buffalo carcass or a, or a leopard on, a, on an impala or a, or an anyala or a bushbuck. It's, it's a proper feast for, the, for this eagle. Like I said earlier, super nutritious, high in calories, excellent fuel for this eagle. And I suppose it's feeding so much like this, it's standing on the ground. It's hardly using any, any, any energy doing this. This is a very energy efficient way for this eagle to be feeding. It's not flapping its wings. It's not having to dive in or swoop in. Like how that kite was feeding earlier. Interesting that it had chosen to rather fly and catch individual insects or individual termites with its, with, with its talons and then fly at the next one. And that seemed to be quite a, an energy intensive way of foraging compared to this eagle that's literally just standing on the ground and it hasn't moved its feet, <laughs> it's just standing there. Darcy Ann, you're asking if this is a juvenile Warburg eagle? Darcy Ann, it does not appear to be, no. Um, it's, it seems to be an adult bird in its dark adult plumage, uh, a dark morph Warburg's eagle. I'm sure, I don't know Darcy, and if you've managed to, if you've been able to see any of the different color morphs that the Warburg's eagle does, does come in, if that makes sense. They, it's kind of three different, different colors that we'll see them in. There's this very dark brown, we sometimes see a lighter brown color variant, and every now and then a very pale, almost white variant. I'm just going to pull up my bird book so I can show you, Darcy Ann, what a juvenile looks like. But I see my bird book doesn't have a photograph of a juvenile. But typically with, with birds of prey, with many of the, of the eagle species, the juveniles tend to have a lot of lighter colored plumage on their body. So the plumage is not necessarily as kind of uniform as this as this Wahlberg's eagle is. 
the juvenile might have lighter tinges to the flight feathers. Interesting to watch, and Glenn and I were just, were just discussing it now, how this eagle seems to get rid of the of the of the wings of the termite alate. Um, it kind of like it grabs the alate and then almost like uses its beak to get to get rid of the wings. It, I think it's taking in a couple of the wings every now and then, but I think for the most part they're dropping off. Arc champion, you're asking how much this eagle could eat. That's a good question, and to be honest, I am not quite sure in terms of an actual uh, number, in terms of of mass. Um, I suppose thinking about, I'm trying to think now. There's 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 numbers that get thrown around with 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 vultures. Obviously, vultures are not quite the same as eagles, but like with a a white-backed vulture. If they're feeding on a carcass, they can normally get, I think if I'm not mistaken, close to a kilogram um, of food that they can eat in a sitting, which is maybe about a fifth of their own body weight. Um, so a fifth of this eagle's body weight might be maybe about, well, let's have a look in the bird book to see how much a a Wahlberg's eagle weighs. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's about a, a kilogram, a kilogram and a half, maybe two kilos. Yeah, a male, a male Wahlberg's eagle about a kilogram. So um, it doesn't appear that there's any information in this book about exactly how much they can eat in a sitting. But I suppose to hazard a guess, we could work off of that same kind of ratio from a vulture. Like I said, it's, it won't be 100% accurate because they're not they're not this, obviously not the same species, not, not, not even the same, the same kind of bird, I suppose. Um, but maybe, sure, 200 grams of termite alates. That sounds doable. Especially looking at how full that crop is. There's a lot of termites that are packed into that, into that crop. And of course, those termites stored in the crop will get passed through... to the stomach a little bit later, digested. It's very impressive that this eagle is still feeding everybody. There were, there were two eagles here initially, and we sat with the one for quite some time, and it maybe fed for about five minutes or so, but then flew off. And this one's been here, it was also, it, it, it started here at the same time as the other one, but obviously a bit more hungry. We didn't get to see the two of them right side by side, but it could be that because with, there you go, there it flies. Often with eagles, the females tend to be quite a bit larger than the males. And so maybe it's a male and female breeding pair, male and female pair. And this one on the, it's been on the ground for longer, maybe the female slightly larger, needing slightly more food, a higher calorie demand. So she's been needing to feed for a bit longer. But there we go, I think she's now satiated, she's filled herself up. And now she can afford to spend the rest of the day resting up in that tree with a full belly and a full crop. And the hardy the hardy dars have moved in now. They're taking advantage of the fact that the eagle has left its um left its its feeding station. It also seems like the, the termites are kind of stemming the flow, or the, or the flow of termites is being stemmed. We're not seeing as many flying around as they were earlier. But the amount of insect life this morning is absolutely unbelievable, everybody. Glenn and I have just been saying we can't move without having an insect land on us. There's termite alates, there's all kinds of flying insects, flies and butterflies and moths and grasshoppers and locusts and an overload of <clears throat> of insect life. It's all come out after the rain.
Well, I think that with the eagle having flown off, Glenn and I are going to keep on making our way down the road. We've moved out of the area where that young female leopard had been hanging around. We're going to go see what else we can find for you this morning. Oh, never mind, you're back with us. <laughs> Still with the hardy dies. We're currently sitting on our airstrip, everybody. And we came here because from a distance, I could see some giraffe and some zebra that were out in the open. But it seems like they've now moved off. I'm just going to quickly scan with my binoculars to see if I can't see where they've gone while we watch the hardy dies. Aha, uh -huh. I see the zebra and I see the giraffe. We're gonna make our way there and when you come back to us, hopefully we'll have them to show you. All right. I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes just to sit and enjoy this scene and all that comes with it. It's a little bit chilly, so they are in and out of the holes. Maybe I should try and whistle for them. Oh, it's so chilly, they're not even doing a little bit of burrow maintenance. They are just trying to remain static, keep vigilance to a high degree. And I think they will stay at this burrow for quite a while today. Unfortunately, no sign of Kuchara and the cub coming out. We've driven slowly, slowly, slowly up and down, just trying to wait for her to come out of this block. It's not a very big block, and I would have thought by now she would be out, but um, maybe I missed her. Maybe she went over the road. It's not easy for tracks. Um, in. Did I just hear an alarm call? Reverse quickly. I thought I just heard a bird alarm call. There's a little game path to our left here. She might be on that game path. No, no sign of her there. Um, the game path that I'm talking about is this one here. You can see it kind of runs off the side um, and down the slope. She's coming from that side if she does cross. Um, she could have also gone over Gary Main. It's a bit tricky here because I can't get on the apex to see both sides and the angles, the roads bend too much. So I've got a very narrow view if I stand at the junction. 
Um, so I've got to kind of go up and down, but you know, if they cross over in the time that I'm around and coming back, uh, it's quite possible. Anyway, I mean, at least we got a view of her to start with. It's, I mean, I know it was brief and it wasn't exactly the most amazing view of her um, and the cub, but uh, we had a nice view at one point um, of the two of them together on the road. But hopefully they'll they'll kind of pop out here again. I'm trying to see if I can see tracks, but I don't see any sign of anything. Craig, we answered this question yesterday um, evening, pretty in depth. Um, but challenging aspects of being a guide, being away from family and friends, um, the, the kind of distance that you have from them is always very, very difficult. So you're far from a support structure um, when things are going bad and you generally just, you know, miss everything that, you know, family brings. Um, I think that's probably the hardest part about it, um, is that you, you're pretty much out on your own in these places. Uh, so, yeah, and you, for long periods of time, you you work every single day of the week for six weeks at a time, um, which can be taxing at times. Um, so, yeah. Oh, where are you guys? They could have gone anywhere from here now. It's been quite a while. I mean, they might even have a kill in the block there. They might have just laid down in the grass. I mean, these are all options that could have taken place for them. Um, if they came out onto this road, they should have been out long ago already. The distance from where they went in versus where they, um, they would have come out on this straight section of road that we're on now, Gary Main, um, they should have been out already. So, you know, it was, the distance was very, very short. Um, and her general direction of travel was north initially and then she cut kind of eastwards. So that's why I thought maybe she'll pop out on the driveway here. Um, and we'll be able to kind of pick her up, but it's tricky because I can't see far enough down the driveway to see if she comes out as well as this road. I mean, this would be the angles that we have. So this road is covered really nicely, but this one is not because if she did cut up and move, this road bends like this and she'll come out on the other side of the bend. Um, but maybe it's worth just sitting for a little bit and listening and seeing if we pick up any signs of a Franklin or a squirrel or there's squirrels alarm calling now. Sounds that way. Annie, I mean, it's not really. They are pretty active all the time. Um, it's cooler today, so that would explain why they would want to be active this morning, um, is because it's not exactly hot at this time of the morning um, in these conditions. But um, when the rain stops and they feel like the rain is gone, yes, then they can be more active because they go and they scent mark and they make sure that they are, are keeping their territory in check and up to, up to date. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose after the rains, the, the, it could be an increase in, um, in sort of activity. Um, but yeah, I, uh, they're pretty active whenever. They, they beat to their own clock to leopards. I've seen them very active in weather where you think there's no ways that a leopard will walk around in the heat. It's too, too hot. Um, but there they are, walking around and being fairly active. All right, I'm going to try and just stop here and listen again for those squirrels, see where they were coming from. In the meantime, let's send you across to Steve, who's on a mission. Hmm, well, of course you found leopards. <laughs> That's what it does. Well, we lost our lions, everybody, but uh, we've just found some more lion tracks. We're on the southern boundary now. We've just had to give our camera lens a bit of time to sort of, uh, line checks just here, give our camera lens some time to sort of stop being so steamy and misty. But those tracks you can see are not as fresh as the ones we were following. These were during the rain, coming from our side and out to the south. So who knows who they could be? A little bit more to the right, down. There we go. Now the tracks over here. 
You can see that the rain is on top of them. They're not very clear. But uh, we were with our pride earlier and they all went into the Milwati, so we weren't able to follow. And we went home to, to see if we could get the camera sorted, but it just needed some time to get itself de-steamed. So we're going to continue on along our little southern boundary, see if we can find any activity. We've had our animals coming in. The rain still seems to be looming. But thankfully, none has fallen since some time ago. It'll be good to know who's come in and out last night. Bearing in mind, we're also checking in all the big trees. Some zebra were running around here. I wonder if we might find some zebras in a moment. Like the wildebeest, the zebra get preyed upon by lions in these conditions quite heavily. Why well, is that? That's a good question. I mean, being a guide, what do we love most? I mean, being out in nature has got to be a Got to be a very important one. What I most like most about this particular job is the ability to do whatever it is I want to do. Being a guide, having guests on the back, you have expectations of what they want to see, what they need to do. But uh, some squirrels alarm calling. But we um, have so many different feeds in general that um, we can go out and we can focus on what we want to, which is quite nice. I quite enjoy that, but this is my office. So my office is a, is a mobile office, changes view constantly. You see the squirrel there, Theo? The zebras have gone back in. You can see him, he's just in a tree here. And you see that branch you got him, eh? What can you see, oh wise squirrel? I don't trust squirrels, to be honest, everybody. I've seen them look straight at a leopard and not make a sound. And he's looking straight down. But in saying that, they sometimes are reliable, but I have not found them to be very reliable myself personally. For birds of prey, most definitely, they've got this high pitch that uh, often indicates a bird of prey. Those I find very reliable, but the, this alarm call. Bearing in mind, it could be for a snake, it could be for a mongoose, it could be for something small running around on the floor. Hello, Ethan, age four. We don't have flying squirrels in South Africa. And these squirrels are very mobile in the trees, but they, they haven't needed or designed the need to fly through the canopy like flying foxes or squirrels have in other parts of the world. These guys are very good at running around on the ground and they can go from one tree to another pretty easily. There's definitely something moving on the ground there, I wonder. I can just go back a bit. I know they do, but I mean, when you're a small squirrel, you get eaten by everything. So it would make sense that you shouted at all. That's why it's hard to say exactly what it might be shouting at sometimes. They don't have a different alarm call for a ground predator as they would for an aerial. Always worth a look though, it is worth a look, but 
I can't say I've ever found a large cat because of a squirrel. Okay, well, we're going to move on. I can't see anything in the long grass. We'll continue on on this uh, southern and then western boundary patrol. I know Tristan's been on the east. Don't think he got this side. He might have. He might have checked the southern side. I'm not actually sure which way he went around. Our game drive radios are are not working due to due to the rain and technical issues in that regard up at the the main tower. It is nice to be out and about. <laughs> Tammy, I don't actually know. I mean, they were predicted to be heavier than they have been, and they were predicted to last until Thursday, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to believe. Okay, so there was a lion that was lying here on the ground during the rain. I don't know if you can see that there. Yeah, can you see that? Right over my shoulder over here. There we go. There was a lion lying here at some point. As you spoke earlier about the lions lying down when they're hunting, they move and then they stop and then they move and then they stop and they listen. But um, this individual, which was quite some time ago, it has rained since. So we'll continue on. Maybe we'll be lucky. Maybe there'll be another pride of lions up ahead in the road. But as I said, it's nice to see. see so the tracks are going straight along the boundary. It's nice to see who's come in and who's come out. And I reckon this is probably an entirely different pride. Maybe the Unkuhumas have come from the south. That would be nice. I haven't seen them in some time. Might even have been remnants of the Talamatis from the other night, but I don't think so, because it doesn't look like there was an enormous amount of rain on those tracks. The amount of rain that has fallen since the Talamatis made their kill has been huge, and that washes away most signs. But this main road is pretty well drained. Craig, you want to know the most helpful animal for tracking predators? Well, hyenas are very helpful for helping us find leopards, but they are a predator in their own right. Uh, guinea fowls can be pretty useful, but uh, early in the morning and late in the afternoon, not so much. Their, their contact call or their alarm calls sound very similar at that time of day. Monkeys and baboons are very reliable because they also then are quite elevated. So they'll often be looking in the direction of, of the predator. And then kudu and nyala also very, very reliable. Bushbuck. The problem is with them is you've then got to find them hidden in the grass. But they're very reliable. Franklins sometimes are, are also helpful, but they also have some similar predators to to the squirrel, so they also will shout at things that you're not necessarily going to find. I'm trying to think if there's another animal I've forgotten. Can't think of another one. Bushback, Nyala, Impala are quite reliable too. Maybe Tristan can think of another animal that will help him find his leopards. So I think the best animal to help me find leopards is <laughs> indeed my good friend Tristan.
Well, we do have lots of animals that we can think of. I mean, Franklins, general birds, um, squirrels, impalas, diker, um, kudu, nyala. There's lots of things in this area that can help us, but none of them are shouting. The squirrels have gone quiet again. They're here somewhere. I just, I, mean, I don't know if they've, like I say, either crossed behind me. Um, the road is so hard that seeing their tracks is going to be near impossible in the light that we've got. You know, near, a bit of sunlight would have helped because we would have gotten a nice sort of contrast on the track. But there's none of that. So we've got soft lighting, hard road makes life to fill. You might think, well, why is the road hard? Be given that it's been raining. It's because where we are, we're up on the on a crest. So this is sandy soils. The water all drains out and then it goes into a crust when it dries. Uh, and then the leopard stand on it, you can't really see. I mean, you can even just see my vehicle tracks are not easy seen on the left side of the road. The right side, easy, but on the left side, you're not seeing much at all. Um, and that's because the left side is much harder and, and less mud. There's more sand up there, um, so you can kind of see a much harder surface. Fiona, most definitely elephants are good at tracking. They 100% know what they're doing. What's that? Hold on a second. Um, they've got incredible senses, so sense of smell, sense of hearing um, is top-notch, um, which makes them very good at their job in terms of finding uh, things. It's not anything to worry about. I thought it might have been a leg of a carcass hanging in a marula tree down the hill there, but it's just a branch that's hanging down. Uh, I was just thinking they, they're both quite full, so it's possible that they went to go drink water at the Mulawani where it's flowing. There's a little pan there and then obviously they might have picked up the scent of Tundi's Cub in just a little loop. And then they've come now back to maybe where they have a kill. I don't know. Uh, that's maybe a theory that I, that could be possible. Um, particularly in this block because we haven't seen them come out. So maybe, just maybe, there is a kill inside here. Um, the problem is the signal where we had them is dicey at best. Um, to start with so I can't really spend much time down there trying to find them uh, and see if maybe they doubled back or if the kill is somewhere close there I've checked the trees that are closest but we do know that Kuchava much like Tandi um, does sometimes use the most awkward trees possible they often are bushy smaller trees it's not these beautiful big marulas where you think oh that'll be nice if a leopard uses that and there's a reason for that they don't like to be as showy um, and, and kind of have their kills on display for even people to see easily they'd rather have it a little bit more hidden in a bushier thicker um, area and that might be what's happened over the course of the night she's stashed it in one of these like little wattles or bush willows or something like that she's, i've seen a lot of cats use wattles particularly um, it makes it much harder for other cats to spot them um, up in the tree if they have the kill there's no ways that they shouldn't have come out by now. I mean, it's been a long time since we saw them, and this block is not big. I mean, for me to walk this block would have taken me 10 minutes, not even five minutes. Um, so they should have been out long ago. There must be something inside here, unless I've missed the track. Justin, just as good as yours and ours, um, they're very, very, very good at remembering things. To give you an idea of how good their memory is, Tundi, after 12 years, knew exactly where to go and den with Clalamba, um, even though it wasn't her kind of core territory. And that's because she was put there as a cub. She used a lot of the same den sites that she was put in you know, when she was little by her mom. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how good the memory is. is she's been able to recall uh, where she was kept and where it was safe for her and then utilize the same ones. And we know this because there's people that have worked here long enough um, to have seen her in those dens. Um, and she's using the exact same termite mound, same hole in the bank, same little root structure in a drainage line. So she's pretty consistent um, with where and what she's doing. Um, and so that means that there's definitely a, a memory. Ah, nice. Paradise wider. Sitting on the tree. 
we'll have a look at this guy. We might as well. Not like our leopards have come out. Um, you'll see it's a beautiful bird. It's got its back to us at the moment. Um, it's so it's tricky to see it. Um, if you see in the mirror, there we go. Um, so it's tricky to see its colours. It'll just be a black back, black head, and then these long black streaming tail feathers that come down. But they've got the most beautiful little yellow collar with this burnt kind of reddish orange um, on the throat patch. It's very, very pretty. And this is their breeding plumage. They get this in the summer. In the winter time, they, that all goes away and they go into what's called eclipse plumage or um, non-breeding plumage, which is a lot more kind of drab and um, dull in coloration and, and resembles more the female for camouflage. So uh, this is just in the breeding season to attract mates. But during the rest of the year, they don't want to attract too much attention. So rather have, um, you know, a drab coloration to blend in. There's nothing in these trees. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm just looking too far. Maybe I need to scan the, the trees closer. But I've really kind of checked properly on these roads. Um, I can't see anything for them coming out. We might have to just call it quits at some point and admit defeat. Not that I like ever admit, admitting defeat. If, you know, once you've got a sniff, it's always good to kind of keep going. Right, so no leopard walking up and down the road here. Okay, let's go back to where we last had them quickly. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to Steve and some birds. Well, welcome back. We are still on our, well, we're on the western boundary now. We had a few birds in the road, but as is their want, they decided to fly away. We just take it really slowly. It sounds like it started to rain in Tswalu. It would always take a few days for the weather to eventually get across that side, but they've had a lot of rain on the western side of South Africa this season. Lots and lots of rain. That area has been going through a huge drought into Namibia, Northern Cape, huge drought for the last few years. So it's blessings for the rains that side. The whole country, I suppose, the last few years. Hello, Chelsea, age seven. You want to know why boy lions have manes? Well, first of all, I think it looks pretty cool, don't you? When you look at a male lion, he looks bigger, doesn't he? He looks a lot bigger. And that's one of the major reasons for the mane makes him look thicker and stronger and more formidable. So that mane will often discourage other males from competing with him, which is a benefit. The thicker, darker, longer the mane is, the older and more experienced he seems to be. So quite often he can avoid fighting with other males due to the fact that they'll look at him and think, oh, he's a bit too big for me and they'll avoid. Because every time these animals fight, that leads to some, can lead to injury and that injury can lead to death. So it's very important that they avoid fighting with that can. There are some Franklins in the road. I wonder if we're gonna catch them. The second reason is that the mane works as a sort of a cushioning around the neck area. This is some vital capillaries and the jugular if a lion gets bitten on the neck there's a very good chance that they can bleed out so it works as a protection and defense because they do fight each other very very physically when they do fight so those are two of the major reasons there's probably a couple other that mother nature's thrown in there that we don't know about it obviously shows maturity it shows um we might as well try it here if we can Shows maturity, shows experience. The uh, birds that have just gone off. There we go, there's some guinea fowl in the road. Okay, let's go catch up with our guinea fowl. That looked like a whole pile of elephant dung in the road. And I think the guinea fowls are quite enjoying the elephant dung. They love the fermented material. There's some Ellie tracks here. A herd of elephants would be nice to see now. That's a road that goes into Juma. We will not be going in there. That looks like an absolute mess from the rains. 
just gonna stop over here and we will get you the okay well it seems like the guinea fowls have found some dung in the road and at the same time Tristan has caught up with an animal that's probably deposited it We have caught up with an Ellie, and um, there's there's definitely something going on here because um, the Ellie obviously has come out. We've the Ellie's fine; it's not too worried. But there's a hyena that's going up and down, up and down, and it's salivating and kind of staring into the bush uh, where this elephant came from. But then there was also three Nyala that walked away um, from that area, and it's exactly where we lost those two leopards. So I don't know if there is a kill somewhere here, or maybe this leopard. I mean, this hyena is just trailing these cats um, in the hope that there's going to be something. Thing, but there's definitely that hyena's amped up and nervous of going into that area. She, the hyena keeps kind of touching the grass there and then running back. Um, but unfortunately, the signal in that exact spot is a pain. Um, five meters down the road with this elephant, we don't have to worry nearly as much. Uh, everything is fine. So maybe there's a kill here. Um, I'm looking carefully uh, in all of the trees, and I thought it would be just good if there's some Nyala around, sit with this Ellie for a little bit, and if they see those leopards, they'll alarm call, and then I'll know, okay, they're in the block there, or, you know, if they walk around and there's no sign of them, uh, they won't alarm, and we know that the leopards probably have then moved. The thing is, though, is the grass is so long that those Nyala could walk right past those leopards, or the leopards could walk right past the Nyala without having to worry too much. I'm not moving because... I know the view is not good with this Ellie, but it will come out. You'll see on the road to the right of where that Ellie is, there is a lot of marula fruits. Um, so he's busy eating marulas at the moment, um, and he will eventually make his way onto the road to feed on them. Uh, there we go. You can see that little trunk coming out now. Miley, very strong. Um, Ellie's trunks are... Um, pretty much all made of muscle um, and they weigh at about 150 kilograms on a big bull like this um, so a 300 pound muscular structure is really strong I mean I've seen them grip trees and pull them out the ground um, that you know wouldn't most men wouldn't be able to do that even if there was groups of them together um, so that kind of gives you an indication of just how strong these guys can be I've seen them throw logs um, knock over signs with their trunks there's a lot of power that they've got in those. I love how they eat the marulas. You see how he sniffs them first, just to check if they're okay. Um, if they're not ripe, then he kind of brushes over them. You are little greedy guts. You're grabbing three or four at a time, aren't you? Let's see how many he puts in his trunk at once. Okay, there's one, two, three. Four. Five. Six. Six marulas at once. Naughty. That's a lot. One, two, no, just two that time. And you knocked that one on. But you can see how that little finger that they, or those two fingers that they've got, help them to be able to um, pick up these marulas. It's cool, isn't it? You, we're talking earlier about their senses. Look at the sense of smell to be able to find those marulas so easily and so quickly. And you see, he's cleaned up pretty much most of the road are the ones that he stood on and he'll now kind of look in the bushes try to see if there's any in there um, there'll be lots of little hidden ones in amongst um, all these trees so he'll find some in there and once he feels like he's eaten everything then he'll just get off and kind of go and get to the next marula to go and feed on it but there'll be lots of these bulls hanging around now the more the marulas are dropping um, the more we're going to see these bull elephants around I wonder where the hyena's gone. It was behind us at one point. And uh, just sniffing about. All right, these guys, after eating marudas, often leave big piles of steaming dung. And it sounded like Steve earlier said that the guinea fowls were making their way towards them. So let's go and see if they've gotten to the dung or if they're up to something else. Well, indeed, they do leave big piles of steaming poo where they go. And what I thought was a pile of elephant dung, it just turns out to be a whole flock of guinea fowl. But up above them, there is a whole other remnants of the herd that moved through. And these guinea fowl are now busy grooming and preening and trying to get themselves back into a semblance of sort of warmth, I suppose, and dryness. 
exposed out in the road. It's the first bit of dryness that they've experienced in a few days, so. And then they'll probably go about their feeding and scratching and turning the elephant dung over, looking for seeds. Turning the vegetation, spreading it out, compost spreaders, and then also feeding on the sort of organic fermentated, fermentating material that's inside. Richard, they can fly. They're not very good flyers, but um, they can go up and clear certain distances and then they generally coast down again. But as a last resort, when they get spooked, they are able to fly, but they're quite a heavy bird. Um, so they are able to get away from a predator with a quick burst and jump. Um, and then that gives them a good 20, 30, 40 yards on the predator. Uh, but then they do spend most of their time running around on the ground. Um, being a heavier bird enables them to have a lower nutrient requirement than a smaller bird. So uh, it's actually quite an advantage being a ground bird because you can walk around, uh, you can also hold eggs longer, you can lay heavier eggs which are a little bit more developed inside. Um, and at the same time scratching around on the ground means that they can access food that other birds aren't really that good at accessing with their very sharp toes, uh, bigger body size, but also when it comes to trying to go far distance, they generally have to walk. But a lower requirement on energy because their body size is bigger. Small sort of flying birds, very nutrient high in their requirements because very small bodies give off a lot more heat and so they have to be much busier. So Kenny Fowl can just sort of go around and just feed on elephant dung. What a life. Picking up the scraps. This is the helmets of guinea fowl, if you are interested. We only get the one species in this area. There are two locally found in the Greater Kruger. But the crested guinea fowl is only found in your much more perennial river systems with a taller sort of riverine canopy forest. But very similar behaviours. Elena, guinea fowl is pretty much the same as a chicken. Uh, you Bear in mind there are quite a few different species of chicken, um, but the whole behavior is very similar. These are called the bushveld chickens. So these are wild, wild, wild African chickens. Essentially, uh, they come from a very similar sort of background and they serve a very similar purpose. They obviously are a buffer food, a food source for many organisms, but then also their seed distribution they're scratching around, looking for worms, corms, insects, and scratching open dung is a vitally important sort of ecological function. So they're very similar. I suppose you get some chickens that are smaller and some that are bigger. I don't really know too many of the species of of chicken around the world, but there's a number of different ones from the tropics. And a number that have obviously, as we all know, been domesticated, but they would have been a wild bird at one point. A very, very long time ago. And now most chickens you see around the world are very reliant on people for keeping them alive. There are some very hardy species we find in Africa called the bantam, bantam chickens. My car is actually named after a bantam. It's very tough and hardy and durable, durable to diseases. And pretty good at fending for themselves. There's lots of animals out in these, in the African wilderness and the African farmlands looking to catch and kill chickens. Birds of prey, caracal, serval. Wild cats, domestic cats. Wesley, I think I might have answered that in the last question. 
uh, in the last statement about what feeds on chickens, guinea fowls have the exact same predators as chickens would have if they were locally found. All the birds of prey from uh, African hawk eagles, martial eagle, tawny eagle, any of the large raptors that we find, to uh, snakes, caracal, uh, leopard, wildcat, serval, caracal, And they breed very quickly though. They, they do very, very well. They're very hardy species. I can hear the elephants. They're inside Juma towards our right. We won't be going there though. We're heading further to the north and then we'll be coming back in from the northern access on the service road. I don't know if you can hear that. There's an elephant making some very loud noise off to our right. Randy, guinea fowls make two different sounds. One is a very loud <whistles> something like that. And the other one is a very loud chattering sound. Tick, 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 tick. I can't do it. I will demonstrate it for you in a moment once my, my phone decides to operate for me and I'll get you the, the call. I quite like the guinea fowl sound. Are you ready to listen? That is their alarm call as well as the sort of get together in the afternoon morning call. Now listen now for the whistle. There's a contact call between a male and a female. It's sort of a collecting, getting them together, breeding call. They pair off later on in the season. And then after having a number of eggs, suddenly you have flocks like this once again. Don't forget um, also that the eggs are quite vulnerable to predation. So it's not just the adults, mongoose and snakes are very, very, and monitor lizards are very, very fond of eggs of many of the ground nesting birds. But uh, it sounds like Kyle has managed to evade some of the rain. Let's send you back over to the west. Sounds like you're not going to Kyle. We carry on. We uh, try to get back into Juma and here with the figure out what those elephants are shouting about. Ox peckers calling. There might be some buffalo around, but there's no sign of any buffalo tracks coming in. I always like watching guinea fowl when they run like that. They look like an old lady with chucked with their shawl around the shoulders, <laughs> running around from the cold. Benny, I'm not sure if the guinea fowl is domesticatable. I've never heard of anybody domesticating one. My, my father used to grow up with them on the farm and they were wild, but they weren't domesticated. They didn't come inside into coops or anything like that. 
Um, so there are many animals around the world and many plants around the world that are not domesticatable and then there are some that are. What exactly the criteria behind all that is hard to say. They're making their little noises now. Sorry fellows, just wanted to get around you but it seems like you're not going to allow us to pass. Lana flamingos have the potential to pass through. They don't occur here normally, but they definitely could pass through on their way to other seasonal pans. They're very sort of aquatic. I've, I've never seen a flamingo in the Kruger, but they have been recorded. Why are you making so much noise? See, so the contact call, these two individuals that have got a bit lost to the right of us are trying to find their way back to the flock. So that is a call that normally if you hear that in a sort of late morning, you can almost be certain there's a predator around, but uh, as you can see, they've just gone and shown us that that is not the case right now. Maybe they're seeing us as the predator, and that is the alarm call they're giving. I'm afraid I've never tried to measure Ben, but they're pretty quick. They're pretty quick on the ground. I don't know what speed though, I'd be lying if I told you. And they're pretty agile on the floor, and as soon as they feel like they're losing the race, they will fly. There we go, they're now starting to process the dung, the scratching. The scratching that's going on now. Spreading out of that material is quite important as it adds, obviously we're right on the road now, so we're not really seeing that benefit, but pushing that dung around in the open area spreads the organic material on the surface, which allows increased sort of microbial breakdown and also increases the cover of the soil surface itself, which allows for lots more sort of organisms to live and to decompose underneath. Uh, elephant and rhino dung that's not scattered like that in the wet season or dealt with by dung beetles ends up becoming very hard um, and solid pieces that eventually get dealt with by termites. Mitch, it's very hard to tell the difference between a male and female guinea fowl. There is slight differences, but it's normally in the behavior. The male is slightly bigger, but it's very hard to see. But when the breeding season, um, the male behaves slightly differently in his approach and the way he moves around. 
but it's not easy to see now when they're all together. And they're not breeding right now. So the female tends to walk flat-footed and sort of slouches over, almost like she's tucking her shawl around her. And the male walks there. That Probably the one on the left there could be a male, middle of screen right now. He's sort of walking on his toes. So, I mean, it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's very hard to tell. Okay, well, it's definitely going to be a birding kind of day in a couple of days, and Tristan has found another for you. It is a birding kind of day, and we're being charged as we speak by a vociferous uh, Swainson's spur file, who I think is taking up the challenge because as I arrived, it was calling, which is generally when they are sort of. They, Marking, well, not marking territory, but advertising that they're around. Let's see if it'll do it again. They have the most beautiful red faces, these birds. Yes, I said that your face is beautiful. Why are you shouting at me? You can see those spurs quite clearly on the back of their legs now, which is really cool. Um, often it's difficult to see them. But hopefully if he stands still again, you'll be able to just make the outline of those spurs on the legs, which is where they get their name from, spur file. And those spurs are used heavily by males, particularly when they're fighting over females. Um, they'll fly up into the air and clash, and then they use those spikes to basically stab each other. It's pretty violent, actually, when you watch Franklin's fight. And uh, they're also pretty quick on their feet, aren't they? All right, buddy, off you go. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. This is your patch of road, we understand, don't worry. Doesn't seem like he's very phased, or she, whichever it is. Not a very pretty call, is it? It's a call, though, that is synonymous with the bush if you're from this part of the world. Um, if you're in the, the low felt of South Africa, and the, you hear this call very regularly. It will often remind you of being out in the wilderness areas. We're also busy tracking a male leopard at the moment. Unfortunately, we, we didn't have any more luck with Kachava and the cub, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Can't off-road, can't check in. We couldn't see anything in the trees. Maybe the carcass on the ground. Maybe they don't have a carcass at all. Maybe they just went a different direction. There's a lot of variables there. So we just decided, you know what, we're going to let, let them be. Um, we'll try again this afternoon in that area, see if maybe if there is a kill, if it's been hoisted. But we've got male leopard tracks that have come all the way from Gauri, Maine, all the way north on Ch uh, uh, Chile Cut Line. I'm sure it must be Mulawati. I don't, Tingana wouldn't have gone this way, and Tingana was seen yesterday at Bufflezook signboards um, by Marcel. So I don't think it's uh, him. This, I'm sure, would be Mulawati on a territorial patrol, and using a big straight road like this is very typical when it's raining for a leopard. and just walk along and they mark as they go. Um, the tracks, unfortunately, have been rained on this morning, so it must have been early hours of this morning, just before that rain started when we went out. Daniel, what's the smallest bird we have on Juma? Would be the grey pendulum tit. Um, that would be the, the smallest, but we don't see them very regularly at all. They, they're a tough bird to find. They've got a very interesting little nest, and I haven't seen too many nests um, here. They, they prefer a little bit more kind of wooded areas on the edges of grasslands. So I think on Bufflesook we'd have more luck of finding the, the pendulum tit than we would have on Juma itself, but I'm sure there is one somewhere. I think I found a nest once on Bushwalk, if I remember correctly. Um, so they are around, but just finding them is very tricky and they weigh a, a, a mere, I can't even remember now, I think it's like seven grams, eight grams is how much they weigh. Uh, they are very, very, very small birds. I'll just double check quickly now. But they are the, the littlest of the ones that we have um, in this area. There we go, yeah, six to seven grams. Um, imagine a little bird of seven grams, a super small little thing. Okay, buddy. This Franklin is making me laugh. Franklin was its old name, Spurfile is the new name, uh, is making me giggle because it's just <laughs> running up and down 
Um, I think it's hoping with all its noise that it's going to attract some attention from a mate, but all it is is attract our attention, and I'm not sure it's that enamoured with our attention. I feel like we maybe are a bit intimidating in our big, chunky Flintstone vehicle because we have our roof on and it looks just like a, a vehicle out of the Flintstones. Thankfully, we don't have to run for it to be propelled. Um, it has an engine, but it definitely has that appearance of a... <laughs> of a vehicle out of a Stone Age area. All right, our bird is gone. I'm not sure if I can see something in the road. I just want to... Dr. Rocky Balboa. Um, Non-native animals that live in the reserve, Steve and myself. Um, no, I don't know. Um, Probably a few different insect species, but nothing that I can that really comes to mind. There was an issue at one point with a, a beetle that was placed in uh, in one of the water sources to try and rid it of hyacinth, um, but I think that's been taken care of now. Uh, so no real nyala, actually. There we go. There's a very good one. A nyala is an invasive animal. It shouldn't be here. Um, nyalas are supposed to be in Zululand, so at Pinda. They're not supposed to occur where we are now. They were brought here. Um, and are actually invasive to this area. What else? I'm trying to think birds-wise, we don't have too much in this area. In Johannesburg, uh, you've got a number of escaped birds that have started colonizing those areas, so particularly uh, parakeets. They're all over Johannesburg at the moment. But yeah, pretty much what it should be. Nyala would be, I reckon, one of the big ones um, that's fairly invasive. Uh, and is causing a bit of havoc with the bushbuck. As much as they're beautiful animals and nice to have them, um, typically shouldn't really be in this part of the world. What's fascinating, I will say this, is that unfortunately I can't show you because this roof is a nightmare and I hate it with every inch of my body because it makes for birding and, and looking in trees very difficult. Um, but there is hundreds of uh, European rollers that are just flying from west to east. M literally, it's just a constant stream of European rollers coming over. Um, uh, the whole way up Cheetah Cut Line, I've just been watching them in threes and fours, kind of crossing our path, going along um, towards uh, the east. So I don't know why they're heading east, but they are at the moment. Interesting to see after having very few European rollers, all of a sudden we've got lots. Right, so our male leopard cut off somewhere. I think he cut off at Hippo Pools Road, but again, a car has driven here this morning. So it drove over the top of the track and we can't use Hippo Pools Road anyway this morning. So even if he did go there, there's not really much I can do. I was just driving the cheetah cut line in the hope that he was still on it, but it was going to be a very long shot given that the track wasn't from right now, now, now. If it had been top of the rain, it would have been really good, but it was before and so cat could be anywhere um, in this near vicinity. Welcome to my car. This is Wendy and she's my favorite. She would love to have your name engraved on her so you can be with her every single time she goes on a safari here in Juma. If you become a wild earth explorer, you will have the opportunity to buy an engraved tag which we will attach to her. We will make sure to send you a digital picture to show you exactly where you are sitting on her. You will have front row seat in every single sighting. What makes Anby on Pinda Private Game Reserve so special is our massive array of habitats. And with that comes, of course, a beautiful diversity of landscapes, but also an incredible biodiversity in terms of plants, bird life and animal life, as well as, of course, our conservation success stories with cheetah, with rhinos, now with pangolins too. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Have you been watching Wild Earth and dreamt of being right there on safari with one of the guides? Well, now you can. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to buy a ticket to dream. You or a friend can hop on board a live Wild Earth show and join our guide on safari. The ticket is redeemable at any of our locations, any time in the future. Only a limited number of tickets are available, so don't wait. Get your ticket now and start dreaming. Terms and conditions apply. 
My name is Ross and I'm a field guide at and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. In a world full of upheaval, we all need a quiet and safe space to breathe. A place where anxiety and stress don't exist. A place where life carries on as normal. Escape to nature with Wild Earth. Welcome back to Joom everybody where the rain seems to have abated for now. How long that will go on for is debatable but we've got some very industrious fellows on the floor over here that are making hay while the sun does not shine. Just over here. Got some harvester termites that are busy left, left, that are busy accumulating all of the grass material. They're busy harvesting it. And you'll see the hole on the left where all it is being accumulated. And while the UV is at its lowest, these termites being very industrious and harvesting, 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 hence the name harvester termite. They have the ability to digest that cellulose material with an enzyme in their gut called cellulase, which helps to digest cellulose. So they don't need to build big fungus growing chambers. They don't have a symbiotic relationship with a fungus growing uh, or with fungus at all. And what I find very interesting is that the fungus growing termites has also got the enzyme cellulase in their digestive system, but they don't use it they use the fungus instead. So that is a relationship that's gone on for a very, very long time. So everybody has been flooded. The birds are coming out in song. I've seen some birds trying to catch some thermals. The termites have had to re-establish their burrows and no doubt they're also a little bit hungry. It's time to go and harvest some food and they are very industrious, aren't they? Very, very industrious indeed. They seem to be getting some leaves as well as grass stalks there. Feeding frenzy. But it has been wonderful being out finally this morning. It's been a few very wet days and being confined to our quarters has made us a little bit cabin feverish. But uh, hopefully the rain will abate and we'll have some more feeds out for this afternoon. Hopefully we'll be able to access a little bit more of the property. But we'll see what this afternoon presents. But thank you for your questions and comments. We'll see you again this afternoon from as many locations as possible. Until then, have a wonderful day and goodbye.